If you haven't seen the Avengers Infinity War movie yet, first of all, what are you waiting for? Secondly, this video kind of spoils a big plot point in the movie, so you have until the end of the intro to this video to click away. Don't forget to come back after you've seen the movie. Okay, from now on this video will contain spoilers for the Avengers Infinity War movie. This video will also contain footage that some people may find a little gross because it includes dead bodies and lots of maggots, so don't say I didn't warn you. At the end of Avengers Infinity War, Thanos achieves his goal of placing all the Infinity Stones into the Infinity Gauntlet, giving himself the power to fulfill his wishes. With a simple snap of his fingers, he kills half the people in the entire universe, doing what he thinks is necessary to combat the problems associated with overpopulation. As we watched some of our favorite heroes fade from the screen, I wondered, what sort of ecological impact could this have on every planet where deaths occurred? I decided to reach out to Dr. Brand Brandon Barton, a researcher in the Department of Biological Sciences at Mississippi State University, to get his take on the situation. Yeah, so my background is climate change research and how climate change affects uh, interactions in food webs, trophic cascades, indirect effects, things like that. Two years ago, Dr. Barton led an ambitious experiment to demonstrate some of the possible ecological effects of a mass mortality event, which is why I wanted to talk to him. As I was watching Avengers Infinity War, I immediately thought about Dr. Barton's experiment, putting out tons of dead feral pigs in the forest to measure how their decomposition affects the environment. However, his experiment was inspired by current scientific trends rather than popular movies. There's a paper that came out in 2014, maybe a guy named Sam Fay. But he has a cool paper in PNAS and he can sh and he showed that, you know, this sort of meta-analysis approach that these mass mortality events are happening more frequently um, and they're happening more intensely and they're happening basically across taxonomic groups. Um, and one of the reasons seems to be uh, and I think global change broadly, but certainly climate change is part of that. And we start changing the environment in broad scale ways and things happen. Ultimately, how does global change or climate change affect communities? And this is another mechanism. And so I think one of the, the real obvious ways to think about this, the way I usually demonstrate it in a presentation is, you know, we, we often hear about how climate change is, change, is affecting like phenologies, migration patterns. We hear a lot about, um, you know, plants are blooming earlier, uh, but are there pollinators arriving earlier? Or uh, maybe caterpillars are emerging, this important food resource are emerging earlier, but they're, they're now emerging before the songbirds that need them for their um, offspring um, arrive, right? And so you, you have an opportunity there by mismatching food resources, consumer resource interaction, you mismatch those things, that consumer shows up and there's no food. So it, it seems very obvious that you could have a massive starvation event, right? Um, I think about two years ago in Alaska, this seabird, the common myrrh, I think 200 to 300,000 of these things washed up dead on the coast of Alaska. And every one of the ones that they necropsy, every one of them had an empty stomach. When things like this happen to animal populations in nature, whether due to phenology shifts caused by climate change, habitat loss, or disease, they're called mass mortality events. The phrase mass mortality event was in my mind as I watched the last few minutes of the Avengers movie. Half the population of the universe seems like a lot of people to die all at once. But what does mass mortality event really mean? What is a mass mortality event? If half of Earth's population dies. Is that a mass mortality event? Yes, probably, right? We agree. If 100,000 people, so that's just a fraction, a tiny fraction, but if 100,000 people, you know, let's say in Mississippi die, is that a mass mortality event? Probably, yeah. If 100 people die, is it a mass mortality event, right? It depends probably on the, you know, 100 people in the county, okay. It's a mass mortality event. Um, if 10 people die, is it a mass? You know, where is that line? And the question we have, where, where does it become a mass mortality event and where does it, or is it just a mortality event? It's probably related to spatial distribution as I sort of uh, hinted at with going from the earth 
to the state, to the county, you know, to the city. Um, it's also temporal. You know, does this happen instantaneously? I mean, if it all happens at once, 10, 10 animals dying is maybe a mass mortality event where if they all happened over a week, you may not say it's a mass mortality event. Um, and then of course the magnitude, the number of bodies and the biomass, um, 100,000 elephants dying is probably a mass mortality event. 100,000 microbes dying is basically you know a drop of Clorox bleach on your desk. Probably not a mass mortality event. So, so it's a really subjective, really it's just jargon. It's hard to define, but we can usually agree. Uh, we, we see it when we know it, we see it. You know, a bunch of caribou fall over dead. You know, hundreds of animals die uh, instantaneously from a lightning strike, which just happened last year. That's a mass mortality event. Why did I decide to interview an expert and make a video on this? Because mass mortality events, like the one caused by Thanos, are very different from normal deaths in the way they affect ecosystems. Much like an ecosystem can have a carrying capacity or a limit to the number and type of living things it can support, an ecosystem can also have a maximum amount of death and decay it can handle without adverse effects. So to me, a mass mortality event is characterized by two, two interesting things that separate it from, ecologically separate it from, a traditional just mortality event, an animal dying. Um, the magnitude, which is subjective, but because of that magnitude, there's also there, there's two things. There's a pulse of nutrients, right? That is outside of the normal amount of nutrients you would see pulsing into the system. And that's the bottom up effect. But there's also a loss of a top down effect because that organism is a consumer um, or a, uh, it certainly is a consumer, but it also has potentially other functions in the ecosystem. And so a mass mortality event is the simultaneous pulse of nutrients coupled with significant loss of an animal's functional role. So functional roles start mattering. A mass mortality event of caribou, right, in the tundra, it's going to have a very different effect than a mass mortality event of the wolves in the tundra. Same biomass, but you have a very different change because the new, the bottom up effect might be the same, the nutrients might be the same, but the loss of that functional role, either herbivory or predation, uh, will mitigate some of those effects or mediate some of those effects. So let's take a look at what the mass mortality event caused by Thanos' snap might look like here on Earth. I did some calculations based on the current population of planet Earth, and it looks like approximately 3.8 billion people would die in that instant. If all of their bodies laid on the ground, like in Dr. Barton's experiment, that would be 18 and a half tons of dead bodies per square mile of habitable land on the surface of our world. Unfortunately, though, we know that people tend to hang out in groups, so the the tonnage per square mile is a little misleading. It's much more likely that the dead bodies would accumulate in highly populated areas like cities and highways piled up if they were standing near one another. This might bring up the grisly imagery from the Battle of Gettysburg during the American Civil War when the corpses in the fields outnumbered the people living in the town. It might also remind you of accounts from the Black Plague as it swept through Europe during the Middle Ages. So let's revise the math for a single large population center like in New York City. I used the population of people who live in New York City to do these calculations, but that doesn't take into account the number of people who commute into or visit NYC on a daily basis. If we're only considering the live-in population, that's over 14,200 dead bodies per square mile of New York City. How does that compare to Dr. Barton's experiment with dead pigs in the forest? Oh, that's way, way more than we ever did. I mean, that's incredible, yeah. But this is where things get really interesting. Interesting. In a real-life mass mortality event, like those Dr. Barton is interested in, the animals die and their bodies lay on the ground to decompose, which is what his experiment was designed to learn more about. However, many of our favorite Marvel heroes and billions of other people didn't just die in the movie, they turned to dust and disappeared. While this is awesome cinematographically, is the dusting actually better ecologically? I think, I think that is significantly better than... Um carcasses hitting the ground. So what happens when, you know, one carcass or a few carcasses hit, you know, the ground and decompose? Um, I mean, it's very weather dependent, but you think about a place like New York City and there's probably not a lot of things day to day dying. You know, there's not, there's not really a robust community of 
of vultures, uh, um, probably blowflies. I, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly flies in the trash and stuff, and maybe it depends on the time of year as well. But imagine if all those car or all, you know, human bodies hit the sidewalk. Normally, a person would go to the morgue, but all well, half the morticians would be dead too. So it's not like they're going to be able to, you know, half the ambulance drivers are dead. Uh, you know, they're not going to be able to just come pick them up. So they're going to lay there. But in a community like that, an ecological community like that, there, there's not this diversity of, of, you know, there's not the biological diversity to provide the ecosystem functions to, to deal with that. And so those animals, those people, what's going to happen is they'll decompose through microbial processes, right? And, and that's way worse. Um, interestingly, you know, when we did our, our big experiments where we had, um, 1600 pounds of feral swine, in a, you know, relatively small area, they didn't smell that bad, especially the ones that were open because those vultures and other scavengers showed up and were removing the biomass. So, you know, yes, we put out 1600 pounds, but really there was never 1600 pounds on the soil. It was, you know, getting consumed and taken away immediately. And the ones that you exclude the consumers from, the scavengers, um, I think were probably in a lot of ways worse because they were decomposing through microbial processes. You're producing all these byproducts. I remember the ammonia that was probably the worst, that it would burn your eyes. Um, we've got one experiment where we actually put a single carcass into essentially a trash can and allowed it to decompose um, with maggots on it, for blowfly larva had, had colonized it. But if you stood back about 10 yards and got the sun just right, you could just see the gas, the fumes, uh, just, just pouring out of this, this container. And so they're producing huge amounts of these volatiles. And you don't want to have that all over your city. <laughs> and so I, mean, I think it's a really good argument for the importance of biological diversity, species like scavengers, their, their, their function in the ecosystem uh, you know, they, they provide this service for free. You know, it's really important. So yeah, putrid gases from decomposition, flies and vultures eating carcasses, sounds like a scene from one of the historical events I mentioned before. Massive amounts of death concentrated in one area is something most of us don't even want to think about, let alone experience. So what was it like to actually be there for Dr. Barton's mass mortality experiment? So when you walk up, I'm thinking about the biggest treatments, because our, our experiment had five levels of biomass, starting with 55 pounds, a single pig, all the way up to 1,600 pounds. Um, but when you went to that biggest site, it was it was loud. Uh, it was surprisingly loud for a quiet forest. Um, it, you could hear the buzzing, right? The sounds of, of flies often, because I mean, there are thousands of them. I don't, I don't even know how many there were, but they're clearly coming from all over the forest and congregating, to, congregating at this resource. Uh, often, the sounds of vultures, you know, you wouldn't really see them, but you could hear their wings hitting the branches as they, as you uh, flush them off of the pile. Um, one of the most amazing things was, so at first you, know, you have the colonization of the adult flies, which are allowed themselves. Um, and with them brought these, all sorts of predators. So you scurrying lizards that were there consuming, you know, anoles in particular, that were consuming the flies and probably the maggots as well. Um, bald-faced hornets, which are probably my least favorite animal on the planet, only because I've been stung by them multiple times, but they were hunting these flies and they kind of left us alone, thankfully. But, you know, they're buzzing around, flying around, and it was crazy to, to watch them actually hunting these flies. Sometimes they would just sit on the edge of like a, um, the if we had an enclosure or some sort of structure, they'd sit there and you could see them kind of watching the flies and then they would jump out and grab one. It was incredible. Um, so, so then the maggots, you know, of course we had this river of maggots that were produced, the, just crawling across the floor. I mean, the whole, the whole forest in that area was covered in maggots, which then pupate in the soil and we come back one day and they were emerging and every stick, every vine, you know, pieces of green briar, pretty much everything touching the ground and then moving up was just coated in uh, juvenile flies or, or, you know, just recently hatched young adult flies. About the next day, they started flying 
because they weren't really able. I think they, they had, their wings had to dry. They, they, they can't take off quite immediately. I remember coming back and bumping into a bush, just kind of brushing against a bush that was next to uh, the carcasses. And it sounded like a helicopter taking off because it was just hundreds, I don't know, thousands of flies, you know, taking off. And just the sound of all of them uh, at once taking flight, it was pretty memorable. If we're going to talk about the ecological implications of a massive die-off of people caused by something like Thanos' power, we need to keep in mind that each affected inhabited planet throughout the universe would have different climate and environmental factors. Even on Earth, there are huge differences in decomposition rates in different environments. The time of the year and the location would matter a lot. Interestingly, you know, so these, these piles of pigs that we, we studied in Mississippi, and Mississippi, as you probably are aware, is hot and humid. 1,600 pounds of feral swine basically gone in a week, just gone. The first pig, one pig, you know, 55 pounds, um, I think it took two days, maybe three days, and it was bones and fur. Now, I'm from Idaho originally. If you did the same thing up there, very different result, right? You have this dry weather uh, and not as hot, and things actually often mummify depending on the time of the year that they die. Um, and so you would have huge variation, you know, whether this was a mass mortality event, whether these people died in New York City versus Miami. Some of our favorite Marvel heroes were trapped on Thanos' destroyed homeworld, Titan, when the mass mortality event took place. What would happen to their bodies if they died on a barren planet like that, where there doesn't seem to be a functioning ecosystem? Would we wind up with mummies of Doctor Strange, Star-Lord, and Spider-Man? Yeah, well, so I mean, I don't, I don't think you need external input to decompose. And so as long as you have humidity, I think a somewhat am amount of moisture in the air and, and relatively warm temperatures, the microbiome within you and I right now will get the job done eventually. If you have a dry condition, you know, warm, dry environment, you might be a very different outcome. Um, yeah, and even if there was um, an insect community, the lack of a vertebrate community could really change things. So you're talking about a very barren uh, place that has no ecosystem, presumably no vultures. Vultures are essential for opening up the carcass that then allows the, the flies and other necrophagous insects to colonize the internal part of the carcass. And that's one reason these things can decompose so quickly. So when you have 20 vultures show up, open a carcass up, then the insects can get in as well. I mean, they just you know devour it from the inside out, literally without those vultures, without raccoons, without opossum, without coyotes, you don't have that. And that carcass would sit for much, much longer. While these scavengers often adapt well to living near humans and are trash, it's unlikely they do so in sufficient numbers to provide the same sort of decomposition services observed in the experimental forest. And then we can wonder about other planets affected during the culling. Do they have robust communities of scavengers and decomposers available to handle the amount of death indicated in the movie? I've always been fascinated by death and decomposition, so investigating the real-world implications for this bit of movie magic from Avengers Infinity War was a lot of fun for me. I asked Dr. Barton if he had any final thoughts on the subject. So uh, death is normal. Everything has to die. Uh, and, you know, we have this wealth of biological diversity that helps us deal with those situations. I mean, they've evolved to handle this. Vultures, flies, these are all providing an ecosystem service that are really important. Some of these animals are not the most attractive, the things that we love, that, you know, these aren't things that we usually have posters of on our wall, vultures, maggots, dung beetles, things like that. Um, but they're really important nonetheless. They're often persecuted. You know, in some places in this world, vultures are, are going extinct. Um, I don't think it's the case here, but certainly that is the case in some places. We lose these species, we lose those free services. And with mass mortality events or just mortality events in general uh, occurring, but more mass mortality events themselves are increasing in frequency and magnitude. We need those species to buffer the effects of these sort of catastrophic events. And then the, you know, the other thing is we, we don't really even know what the effects of these events are. You know, certainly they affect the population. A mass mortality event of deer is bad for deer, especially if you were one of the ones that died but we are just scratching the surface at understanding 
the, the indirect consequences. We elevate fly abundances. Well, now we elevate wasp abundance or hornet abundances. We elevate anole abundances because all these things are eating that resource. Their populations increase. In the case of a mass mortality event of people, we can imagine some other animal populations that might experience booms. All of the different fish humans haul out of the ocean to eat each year would experience a predator release, meaning eventually most of their populations would bounce back to pre-overfishing levels. Additionally, rats and cockroaches are already a problem in urban centers, but they would probably drastically increase in number due to the available food resources. And that's where a new set of problems arise. Some of those animals are flying around with microbes on them. Some of those microbes can kill you. Uh, anthrax, for example, we found on these pigs. Do you want those flies now flying into your window and landing on your sandwich? Um, so that the point is, you know, these community interactions, these interspecific interactions between predators and prey and consumers and mutualists and all these different things spread these indirect effects in ways that we can't even predict. And so the, the answer, only answer I know is to study them and to try to protect the integrity of the system. Keep those species there that are doing that service so they can help mitigate that effect for free. I'd like to thank Dr. Barton for being such a good sport and answering all of my questions. If you're curious about any of the research mentioned in this video, I've put links in the description. While the mass mortality event caused by a single snap of Thanos' fingers may have dramatic ecological implications, I'm sure most people watching the movie also thought about the impact this sort of event would have on society. My friend William over on Canubis Productions decided to answer this question in a partner video. You should totally go check it out. If you liked this video, Video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. Remember, my goal is 500 subscribers by the end of June. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.